one and go. Yeah, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, today we decided uh, to uh, focus on the digital uh, programmable euro. Uh, we have really some keynote speakers here from an international level coming from basically all around the world, right? From institutions, uh, companies, universities, and so on. And uh, maybe Philip, you can give me the, uh, the right to quickly share my uh, screen. Um, and then I would uh, quickly like uh, to take the chance to uh, present uh, the project to you who basically organized. Uh, this uh, today. Um, yeah, the digital euro basically is on the rise. I think that's that's pretty clear to everybody. It's uh, focusing on um, the entire uh, topic of um, getting the euro in a digital format, most probably on a blockchain format, but not necessarily. Uh, that's why we uh, have set up the Digital Euro Association. It's a uh, non-profit. Uh, it will become a non-profit association at that point of time. Uh, so far, it's basically being housed uh, at, the, at the Frankfurt School of Finance and Management. It's not associated with any institution. It's a private um, association, um, a private group. And the goal is basically to help understand the potential of the digital uh, program of Euro. <laughs> That means uh, the Digital Euro Association would like to help with education in this field, uh, for example, with individuals, also with uh, regard to universities, companies, and so on. Then we would like to form a community because we felt that uh, very often it's not easy to identify um, experts in the field of CBDCs and Digital Europe in the entire world or in Europe. Uh, sometimes the experts sit in France, Spain, Ireland, UK, Germany, and even within Germany, sometimes they sit in uh, Stuttgart, sometimes in Berlin. And so it's not easy to identify uh, skilled people in the field because it's a wide network. And that's why the Digital Euro Association also would like to form a community to uh, basically bring the people together who, um, who know this uh, topic a little. And of course, everybody uh, could become part of this uh, community. And uh, with this, we would also like to form um, possibilities for collaborations. That's what we are doing today, where people come together, discuss this topic, and hopefully um, the audience is really basically getting the feeling that the topic is important uh, and that all kinds of institutions are, or, and companies are pushing these fields, both from an institutional level, but also from a private level. Yeah, we have a couple of uh, fellows who basically uh, signed up uh, with us being part of the community. Part of them are uh, today here, but we have, um, I think, more than 50, more than 60 people uh, right now. And in case you would like to become part of the community, then uh, you're welcome to do so. It's, uh, it's meant uh, to be uh, for free. It's a network of experts. We would like to connect people. We would like to foster knowledge. And uh, we hope uh, that with this, we could also um, bring about a platform to also um, drive this development in entire uh, Europe. Yeah, with this, I would like to quickly uh, <coughs> shut down my small presentation and hand over back uh, to Alexander and Lena, who are moderating today's panel discussion. I hope this was okay, Alexander, and in case you have further uh, details to say, please do so, but I wanted to keep it very brief. No, th thanks a lot, Philip, for this uh, quick introduction. I think we, we want to use most of the time today for our discussion with the, with the panelists. And I would hand over uh, right away to, to Lena, who is going to introduce our panel today. Yes, thank you. Welcome also from my side. Um, so a quick introduction of our panelists that we have here today. Um, first of all, Professor Dr. Peter Bofinger. He's a former member of the German Council of Economic Experts and now a lecturer at the University of Würzburg. Then we have Dr. Jürgen Schaaf. Um, he's from the European Central Bank, advisor to the senior management of the Division for Market Infrastructure and Payments. Then we have uh, Julian Legop with us. He is director of policy at the DM Association. And last but not least, Miguel Ordonez, the former governor of the Bank of Spain. So I do not want to lose too much time and start directly with my first question that I would like to address to Mr. Schaaf. Um, so according to the ECB, what could be potential reasons to issue a digital euro? Thank you very much uh, for having me and thank you very much for the first question. I try to be rather brief and concise so that we have more time later for the other panelists and pay discussion. Uh, one word though to the definition, what we understand when we talk about a digital euro. Um, there I want to be really concise and precise. So, 
We are talking about central bank money. Literally, the euro is issued by a central bank, the ECB in this case. So it's a liability of the central bank. First important point. The idea is to make it available to the citizens and to firms in digital form. So it's going to be digital and available to basically everybody. And it's supposed to be used for payments. It's not supposed to be an investment asset or anything. So that's the key definition uh, to be clear what uh, we have in mind when we talk about a potential digital euro. What it is not and what it is not aiming at is crowding out cash. It's supposed to be a complement to cash. Our political leaders within the ECB have promised to keep cash and there's no intention whatsoever to abandon cash. Um, we are aiming at synergies with the industry that includes banks and payment service providers. There's no intention to crowd them out or to take away their business. And we believe in the superiority in terms of innovation of the private sector anyway. Last point in that context is that we don't think that the digital euro is necessary right now. So for the time being, it's not necessary. It hasn't been necessary so far. We are well equipped with the means of payments that we have at hand, and we are well equipped with the cash at hand. <laughs> However, there are potential scenarios that might make it necessary to have a digital euro in place. So um, the main scenarios that we have to be prepared for is first that we see there is a decline in the usage of cash um, that has been accelerated in the pandemic where in particular cashless payments have been used and have gained prominence and popularity. And what we observe in Scandinavia, for example, is that it's hardly feasible anymore to use cash when uh, people pay in, in a retail environment. So we are not there yet. Cash is still very important in uh, Europe, in the Euro area, but we have to be prepared for an accelerated trend. Second, that's a political perspective is uh, tackling some of the sovereignty concerns that have been stirring around now for a while, um, being afraid that some big uh, foreign private digital means might crowd out um, the currency or also some other future foreign CBDCs. <laughs> Again, this has not been the case so far, but the euro system needs to be prepared for these kind of scenarios the acceleration of which and of for scenarios that we actually do not know yet. So that are the key scenarios to why we would need a digital euro. And for the first question, I leave it there. Thank you for that first inter um, overview. So Mr. Bofinger, I read a recent article of yours on Vox where you have stated that CBDCs might become a gigantic flop. Um, can you explain to the viewers and to me, what exactly did you mean by that? And do you still believe that the digital EU has any use cases or is in any way relevant to us? Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. I think it's a very interesting panel here. And yeah, how did I come to this conclusion? Well, if you ask yourself, what is the reason to open an account with the central bank? We all have bank accounts. And the question is, why should I open an additional account with the central bank? What is, what is the attractiveness? Um, you could say, well, uh, the money is safe uh, at the central bank, while in a commercial bank, it's not 100% safe. But as we know that there is a deposit, uh, there are the deposit insur insurance schemes, uh, everything up to 100,000 euros you have on a bank account is already auto safe. So safety is not an argument. It would be an argument if the central bank would be willing to allow CBDC holdings above 100,000 euros in the central bank. Then many people would like it because there are many wealthy investors who know they will be bailed in uh, if a bank restructuring takes place and if they have bank deposits exceeding 100,000 euros. So that would be really attractive, but that's not what the central banks want. Instead, the central banks say you should hold only 3,000, no, no more than 3,000 euros on your CBDC account. If you hold more than 3,000 euros, you will, uh, will experience prohibitive interest rates. So what can I do with this account? Whenever somebody 
makes a payment to my account exceeds 3,000 euro, then I get these prohibitive interest rates. I do also don't think that it's possible uh, to, to have a to withdraw, to, 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 to have an overdraft on, on this account. So what is the attractiveness of this, of this central bank account? I simply don't, don't see it, especially if you know that, of course, cent uh, commercial bank accounts offer a broad spectrum of many, many services. So in my, it's really not, not clear why, why a CBDC account would have any attractiveness to an ordinary person, why it would, there would be a reason to have a parallel account where I shift my money back and forth and where I really have to take care that I know it doesn't exceed 3,000 euros. So as, the, the, as, it, as an uh, account CBDC, I, I don't see any attractiveness. So you could say, well, but CBDC, is designed as a, as a means of payment, as a digital substitute for cash. But if, if regular payments are concerned, there are so many attractive options now to make digital payments with credit cards, with uh, Google Pay, with Apple Pay, with PayPal. They are very attractive private payment systems. Why should I need the digital euro for this? Uh, and, and so for regular payments, I don't think that the digital euro would be an attractive alternative to cash. There are some older people and some people who don't like digital, and that's, why, that's why they pay cash, but they would also not use a digital euro. No? <laughs> then if people are concerned about anonymity and all that stuff, but they would not then use a digital uh, means of payment, they would still use cash. And of, cor and, and of course, cash, the main attractiveness of cash is, of course, uh, that, that it can be used in the info for inform in the informal sector of the economy, and and people who use cash there they would not would not use a digital euro. Of course, you can design some kind of token, uh, uh, digital euro, some kind of uh, electronic money. But there are very strict regulations for money laundering, uh, and and so you could have some hundred euro or fifty euro uh, tokens, but that would also not be very useful. So. I don't see that, that the CBDC is, is something that, is, that, that could be of any interest. Uh, when, when talking about extreme cases, as, as Jürgen Schaff said it, that, um, so far I don't see that there is a decline in the use in, in the role of cash in, in the major currency areas. If you take cash, the currency in circulation relative to GDP, it's even increasing in, in the US as, as in the euro area. Sweden is a special case. But, but it's not something that, that is relevant. And but if and even if you see that this that, that, that this trend is there, and that you say, okay, we want to maintain the access of ordinary people to the central bank balance sheet, then please keep make sure that cash is always available, that there is a nationwide system of cash dispensers, and then you don't you don't need you don't need CBDC. And finally, if you want to do something against uh, uh, huge uh, international payment platforms like PayPal or DM, yeah, then it's not, you it will not succeed with national solutions or with one currency solutions. Yeah, then you need global solutions. You need solutions that use multi, several currencies at the same time. And I think that's the experience that, that, that DM has made. It's not a good idea to have only one currency. You need many currencies. And then again, uh, digital euro, I don't see that this is something uh, that could, could be competitive in the, in the competition with PayPal, which exists right now, and with Libra, I don't know. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Mr. Ordonez, I also read an article of yours where you have described the versions of CBDCs that are currently being discussed as limited CBDCs, but you say that what we actually need is a full CBDC. So can you explain to us um, how you differentiate between limited and full CBDC? Well, yes, but, uh, before, thank you very much for inviting me to, to this panel. No? But yes, I think that the nomination of full CBDC uh, uh, for me help us to understand what we are doing now, that is a limited CBDC. Then a full CBDC means that you don't put any limitation. You open the safe money of the state, the, the central bank digital currency, open to citizens and firm without any limitation. And that, of course, have all the, the benefits that have been studied uh, for many times that uh, a money that is more safe, you don't have banking crisis, you don't have problems of that. The banking crisis are the most destructive of all financial crises. Uh, uh, you don't need to use a monetary policy indirect 
that ha is creating a lot of problems also. And uh, as the that money is uh, is fragile, is a risky financial asset. During centuries, we have been the states uh, uh, introducing protection privileges to the banks that suffocate competition and, and made impossible to have competition. And then the third good benefit of a full CBDC would be the competition in banking activities because you separate money that would be safe and you could introduce without fear competition in all banking activities, especially in banking and lending. Then that's the, the, the idea. But uh, uh, certainly is not what we are going to do, as Jürgen has said, and we know that uh, 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 we are going to put some limitation. And I think that is correct. I think this is the right thing. Why? Because uh, you cannot uh, uh, change overnight, especially the banking industry. At the end, at the end, the banking industry have to transform, have to learn how to operate without protections, without privileges, and operate in a free market uh, without the protection of the state that are numerous, lender of last resort or uh, uh, insurance deposit and so on, and the prohibition to uh, use uh, uh, money, uh, central bank digital currency then. But I think uh, this should be done in, in phase. And then I think it is important to start with a limited CBDC because you allow time to the banks to transform their industry and, and learn how to operate in a total competition, especially in banking activities, because they will lose money. If you open that, obviously uh, it will happen that you uh, all the, the, the deposits in, in banks that are very fragile will go to a, to a, a save money. Then I think this uh, uh, is important to see, to compare the current system that is full of problems the, the system that we could have with a CBDC without limitation and the importance, and I totally support to start with a limited CBDC because that allow times to make a transformation because the banking industry is not a small industry, it's an entire industry important, but they are used to act with the protection of the state. And the final picture of what we are doing now is to introduce. In fact, I think that is the last bastion of uh, non-market economy in our economies. No, and this uh, is the, the structural reform that we need. But now, now we should start with a limited uh, CBDC. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so, Mr. Legoc. Which role does DM play in all this? Um, how does DM fit together with a CBDC? And are we talking about competition or collaboration here? Thank you, Lena. And uh, it's uh, such an honor and a privilege to be with such distinguished uh, panel members today, uh, as well as supporting the uh, Digital Euro Association. I'm gonna take a little bit of what both uh, Dr. Bofinger and Dr. Uh, Schaff mentioned, as well as, as uh, Mr. Miguel Hernandez. And I thought I would just start with the human aspect of what we're talking about here today, which is that we have a common cause uh, where private sector innovation and the future of payments uh, should be welcomed, uh, including having a digital euro. And by show of uh, kind of virtual digital hands and emojis, and it was Dr. Bofinger that touched on that, I want to ask uh, everybody listening today, how many of you have an account with a central bank? And so I'll, I'll pause to see if I even see any of my, my fellow panel members that have an account with the central bank. So central banks, as you're well I aware, they operate. Uh, had you had one. one, all right. And I was, working, I, was work, I was working for the Deutsche Bundesbank, and so I had a Bundesbank account, but long time ago. <laughs> that, that's same, great. same applies to me, by the way. The same applies to me. So we have uh, uh, some some twenty percent having had the experience of having a an account with the central the central bank, yeah, which which that, is probably is... not not representative <laughs> of the general population, right? We have to probably add that. <laughs> Even that, the government is... central bank, because I never had uh, an account in the central bank. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. The, and as you're well aware, and Dr. Schaff talked a little bit about it, that you know central banks operate with private sector banks and are inherently not market based. And so at, at a high level, as you're well aware, most central banks, they control money supply, uh, they regulate uh, banks in some, some areas and are really, really the, the lender of last resort. So control over monetary policy and sovereignty, the economy is absolutely a uh, public sector activity. Uh, and I think it will continue to evolve in the future. 
Now, I think the balancing act that you have to have is on, on, on uh, the other hand, um, you're contending with you know, technology. And uh, you can see that uh, throughout this past year, technology has changed all aspects of our lives, um, especially being able to have this Zoom conversation today, uh, for example, um, and being able to really interact with, with our loved ones over the past year in ways that had, had not and would not have been possible without um, all the innovation in telecoms uh, uh, over the past several decades. So I, I think one of the exception to this innovation is really the way we exchange value. And that's where blockchain is really the game changer. So uh, the ECB, I think it's wonderful. They're taking a look at uh, uh, CBDCs and, and a potential uh, digital euro. And this balancing act that I just talked about is how do you ensure a vigorously competitive uh, wallet environment and financial services environment that applies the same risks and the same rules? So my personal view is that having an open competitive uh, uh, wallet systems that interacts with a stable coin and with CBDC is the right approach, especially for, for retail consumers. So now I'm gonna get back to uh, uh, really the question, Lena, that you had for me around uh, competition collaboration. And so I don't think it's competition. I think it is very close to uh, public-private partnership and collaboration. But in my view, it's a co-opetition. Uh, and when the CBDCs exist, because I think it's only a matter of time, um, it will serve as an upgrade uh, to, to the DM payment system. And so uh, payment, uh, digital payment uh, systems like the one that we're building and, and others are building um, uh, would benefit from a digital euro and a CBDC. And at the end of the day, it is not a zero sum game. So hopefully I've answered uh, the question, Lena, back to you. Okay. okay so I'll, I'll, I'm going to take over here because I, we have heard now a lot of interesting statements and also diverse statements, I would say. <clears throat> I would maybe like to give uh, Jürgen Schaaf the a quick opportunity to maybe address one or two points that he has heard maybe from, from Professor Bofinger. Um, I'm sure, um, uh, Dr. Schaaf, you have a, a couple of, uh, of words to say about what you have just heard. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, uh, I, I'm very uh, happy to, to learn that uh, Peter Buffinger and I had the same employer at one point. So at least there's one thing in common the, for, for the discussion. Um, it's important to have the questions that he raises here now, because up to well, a couple of weeks ago, maybe we were more confronted with the other fear that the um, digital euro, when it comes, please, remember that we are still in the phase of reflecting. Um, can you still? OK, uh, so we are still in the phase of reflecting. Um, up to a couple of weeks ago, there was more the fear that the digital euro would crowd out the banks. In particular, the banks were afraid of too big a success of such a digital euro. Now, now the trade-off comes in. Now there are also some concerns that it might not be a success at all. So in the preparation that will start probably in, in uh, as of mid this year, we have to find a middle way. Uh, we, we don't want to have something that is not successful at all, that doesn't play a role, but we are aware of the fears that are out there in the banks, financial industry, and the private sector who comes up with great services that adds on to the currency as we provide it. Couple of things in the arguments from uh, Professor Buffinger. So um, the account thought, um, as I said, we are, we are not in the end of the conceptual reflection. What would not be the case is an account that you or me had as former employees of the Bundesbank. So it would not be an account uh, like branch of a bank provides with all the services. This is not intended. This is more a balance sheet logic, so that it's attached to the balance sheet of the central bank. These 3,000 euros that um, are often discussed now are based on the calculation, roughly uh, taking into account all the euros, the bank notes in circulation, uh, inside the euro area, outside, even those that have been lost somehow, uh, but they are accounted in the balance sheet of the ECB. So they are liability 
And the amount there divided by the citizens of the euro area gives you a rough number of 3,000. So this is just an orientation. Um, how to deal with that? Um, to avoid that it's too attractive, the 3,000 are just an example. If you want to avoid crowding out the deposits of the banks, which is intended not to do, then you could put a lid uh, or you could do it a bit smoother by making with some interest rates the, the holding more or less attractive. So that are options that are theoretically and conceptually discussed. Um, then the international, the international role. Um, it's not part of this discussion now and the reflections of the digital euro, but with the BIS, there are, of course, discussions on how to improve cross-border payments. The remittances in the uh, emerging world is a big topic. Um, cross-border payments is very important. It's expensive, um, partly also because of AML considerations. Uh, and there are discussions that are among the central banks. It's not necessarily a requirement that you have a CBDC for that, but it could make the thing a bit easier. So um, you would not necessarily need a global CBDC. Um, you probably would not even need a CBDC to improve the cross-border payments among uh, countries and huge constituency. Um, the last thing, uh, privacy, same thing. Uh, of course, you want to have as a citizen a very high level of privacy. The good thing with a central bank is that the central bank as such has no autonomous interest uh, into the data of people. So uh, other than our researchers who are interested in statistics, the central bank has no genuine interest in the data. You can program uh, the kind of money that we have in mind. You can program the level of uh, privacy and you can, and we probably have to find a way to find a balance in between complying with the AML legislation, uh, money laundry prevention and the need for privacy. So these things are conceptually challenging they need to be balanced out, um, but it's definitely high on the agenda and it's absolutely welcome that we have these critical discussions also now and here. Okay, thank you. So I would, I would like to give the word to Professor Bofinger. Um, Mr. Bofinger, please feel free to respond to anything uh, Jürgen Schaaf has just said. And I would also uh, like to give you a, a second question, um, which is, do you think that in a monetary system of the future, there could be a coexistence of a CBDC and private forms of money, such as a DM or other stable coins, maybe? And could they both play a role? Let me start with a question. And it also goes to what Julian said. I think a very good, see a good, very good synthesis between uh, payment systems like, like, like DM and CBDC, but this is then a kind of wholesale CBDC. It's not the retail CBDC. And as what Jürgen Scharf says, obviously it's also not the real retail CBDC that, that we have in mind. If you say it's not an account, the question is then what is it? But, but of course, if, if you have these payment systems like DM or PayPal, and if they are obliged or even willingly uh, uh, to hold CBDC as a collateral, and I think DM has said this explicitly that we are interested in, in CBDC as a collateral. I think that's a very good solution because that also gives uh, establishes a nexus between what these payment systems do and what the central bank does. So it, it keeps these payment systems somehow under the control of the central bank. But this is a completely different story. This is not the retail CBDC for people like you and me, but it's, it's, it's a synthetic CBDC, a wholesale CBDC, um, which has a completely different logic. But I would say for such a scheme, I see a lot of potential. Uh, so my, my problem is more with these 3,000 euro or 5,000 euro bank deposits, which I don't know what they just, I think it doesn't do not make much sense. And, and the idea that you need some kind of token CBDC uh, or the idea, the idea that central banks create a new payment system like they do it in, in Sweden, uh, which I find almost a little bit ridiculous. <laughs> a small country and you, you create your own e payment system 
uh, for your own national currency, I think this is really, really parochial. Uh, and, and as far as the payment systems are concerned, uh, it's not about a substitute for cash, it's to, de to develop a competitive system like to, to DN maybe, also to PayPal. I think PayPal is, is, is right now set the standard because DM is not yet there. So it depends what, what you will be doing. Yeah? But at, right now there is PayPal as a central bank. I would ask myself, what can we offer uh, that, is, that is better and more effective than PayPal? And if my answer is I can't do it because I'm only a central bank and I do not have this vast uh, spectrum of, of, uh, of services that can be offered, um, then I would see no chance. Okay, that's so far. That's... Yeah, let's maybe, I would like to hand over this question to Julian directly, what you've just said, uh, Professor Bofinger. So Julian, what do you think, what can DM deliver that maybe CBDCs cannot deliver? What's the use case you are addressing with which CBDCs are, are probably not addressing? Yeah, thank you, Alex. And I think we talked uh, a little bit about this idea of optionality and consumer optionality. And today, Uh, uh, consumers have a choice uh, by, by using cash, like we talked about, and, and, and credit, plastic check. What we're feeling today, we felt uh, historically in the past. Um, the, the big use case where I think a, a DM payment system can, can really support is uh, remittances uh, and international uh, type of payments. Uh, it was so great to hear Dr. Schaff talking about it as being a priority for the ECB and as well as uh, Dr. Bowfinger uh, uh, alluding to it. Uh, in a world where 1.7 billion people, as you're aware, don't have a bank account, 1.3 billion are, are, are in the banks, I think digital currencies offer another solution uh, that can help kind of drive down the costs, uh, as well as align, of course, with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals of bringing the average of, of uh, 6.8%, according to the World Bank uh, Q4 data, down to, to approximately 3%. And I'm going to go to uh, Dr. Bowfinger, your, your excellent example Uh, just a few months ago, I had to uh, uh, send money. I'm in uh, Washington, D.C. currently. Uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm an, uh, a recovering regulator. I worked for 10 years at a, as a bank regulator here. And my niece is in Paris. And so for Christmas, I wanted to send her, send her some money. And I used the smartest type of remittance uh, uh, payments. And it still cost me uh, just under 5%. So in order for us to get down to 3%, I think we need uh, large-scale innovation. The good news is we've made, made some progress, uh, but the progress has been fairly slow. And one of the reasons why um, is uh, the lack of interoperability. If we take a look at um, uh, financial systems, uh, they're mostly uh, silos and they don't talk well to one another and typically they need an intermediary. Now in Europe, the benefit is you have a payment directive. And in fact, um, uh, payments within the Eurozone are quite efficient, uh, more efficient than other places in the world. So I see the DM payment system really as supporting these remittance and cross-border payments and really pro-competition where over time we could see individuals building digital wallets that accelerates the, the competition uh, due to having an open source code and it being interoperable. So I, ha I have a very, very quick question for, for Jürgen Schaaf before we then go to, to, to Miguel again. Um, Jürgen, uh, will it be, because it was also a, a question from our, from our viewers, uh, will it be possible to use the euro outside of the, the digital euro outside of the euro area? Well, if you allow me, Alexander, I would like to comment a little yeah, bit. Yeah, sure, Miguel, please go It's ahead. Because I think uh, uh, to understand well and do not have in misconception, I think it is important to differentiate between, between money and payments. It's very difficult because in our current system, banks perfectly are money and payments together. Then, but if you uh, try to do that, and in fact, the reform of a good CBDC is to unbundle money from payments, that uh, allows you not to talk, for instance, about uh, uh, private money, because the money will be public. And, and, and you, we should not uh, always uh, talk about the state or, or central bank entering in payments, not. Money is public and payments are private because it's the only way to have competition. But uh, the problem is when we have, as we have now with the commercial banks, uh, uh, a private money, they create money, they create a lot of problems we have and so on. And then, and that was the same with Libra. If you allow me, Julian, I think that the, from the 
first uh, proposition of Libra that was, we are going to create Libra, back it by treasuries and so on. The central banks reacted and said, no, you have to be backed 100% by man, uh, public money. Because you could do, and I think it would be wonderful that uh, DM enter in, in, in payment services, but never doing what the commercial banks are doing now, because for that we have just commercial banks. I mean, not the problems we have of uh, bad monetary policy, banking prices, and so on. Then we should distinguish between money that have to be public, and there the private should not do anything because it's the safety of the of the central bank. They don't. The, the central bank do not need to have insurance deposits. They do not have need lender of last resort as the cash. The bank notes. The notes do not need uh, all these protections of the state. The state provide safety, as provide uh, police, uh, security, and so on, and money. And then the payment services should, the, the central bank should not do anything, probably an infrastructure to link the register, because the central bank will lose, in a certain sense, the power, because they would be a register and decide the creation of the money that will be put in the uh, in the pockets of the citizens, then they will not have the power they have now, and they should allow all the private initiatives, DM, ALSA, FinTechs, Smalls, and so on, to use that public money. Uh, then, uh, because uh, uh, on your question, I am not uh, uh, study very much all the international relations. I am more worried about uh, what I see from the competition idea, the yeah. unbundling yesterday in, in Cornell University published uh, uh, an article that I like it very much. Uh, the title was unbundling money, banking and payments. That's the key, unbundling. Then yeah. do what is had a great advantage is provide safety, the ECB and the, the central bank and the private initiative, because if you don't have private initiative, you don't have competition, you don't have innovation. Mm -hmm. And for to provide the public money, you don't need information. It's just that this is public, like the notes. Yeah. In, the, in the 19th century, that was a big discussion. And at the end, they decided, no, the money is printed by the central bank. Yeah. And everybody could use the, the notes as they want. So, Miguel, I believe what you're describing is probably less a problem for DM because, Julian, please correct me if I'm saying something wrong, but I think DM would be happy to back um, their DM tokens 100% by central bank money, right? I think Libra Paper 2.0 was a great advantage. Yeah. And that even uh, tell the authorities, I am going to comply with that. You should allow me to do that because I am yeah. going to provide payments to 1,700 million people, what is very good. But, but, but Miguel, here is here is the point. Here is the point I was trying to make. Um, for DM, it's not a problem. But what you but there we have institutions today that are able to create money, which are yes, banks, yes. right? And that for banks, I, for I banks, it could be a problem. In, no? in the Senate, uh, when they discussed it, uh, Libra and Facebook and so on that one of the authorities said, we are not going to tolerate that one private enterprise create money. And I said, well, if we are allowing <laughs> every day, <laughs> because yeah. uh, the, uh, one of the things uh, that important is because people say, well, the, 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 the central bank have control of the money supply. That's not right. The creation of the money is mm -hmm. done. And that's why the, the central banks now, the only thing they can do is to influence because the banks could create more or less. And that is terrible. And that is terrible because you, the, the central bank do not have what is important, that is the creation of money. And if you have separate completely, the central bank will create the money that others, private institution, will do payments, lending, whatever you want to do with the money. So maybe, uh, Jürgen Schaaf, would the ECB want to take over the business of, of private banks? in providing money? I, uh, the answer is no. Um, but you, you had another question before on the uh, international usage as a means of payments outside the euro area. Uh, on that, now, uh, this is not the highest priority now. Um, we are aware of this. And at one point, we have to tackle that issue, ideally in cooperation with other major central banks, um, which must not, uh, doesn't need to lead to a solution that you pay with euro outside the euro area. What we are currently talking about is the 
means of payment function. So um, when we think of the euro outside the euro area, it's normally or, or often cash that is used for saving in emerging market countries. Um, so th this is, we, are, we don't want to create a an, an, uh, safe asset to invest in outside the euro area. And if the means of payment, and we are not intending to do a euroization outside the euro area. So, and in that context, um, also the point Peter Buffinger made uh, earlier, it is true that the amount of cash in circulation has risen in recent years relative to GDP, but this is mainly for hoarding purposes. When we have a look at transactions, the, the importance and the relevance of cash in payments at the point of sale, we had a recent study, study is going down. There's, an, there's a trend that is going down and uh, in terms of volumes, it's already far below 50% in uh, terms of numbers of transactions, it's roughly about 50% only, and uh, the pandemic has accelerated that trend. So, um, this, is true. this is true, but what, why do I need a digital euro for that? So I have my Google Pay, my Apple Pay, I have my credit cards, and, and I can pay with PayPal. So what, what is the, the additional value added that I have if I use a digital euro? Why, why do I need it? Well, what I said right now was just to, to correct something that you just said five minutes ago. Uh, your no, question no. now is, first of all, it's, yes, the, the, the important point, if we are talking about means of payment, you have three money functions, as you know, and we are focusing on the means of payment function. Um, the, the reason why the holding of cash went up was more the store of value function. So we have to distinction, distinguish this. That's, that's why I made the point. The numbers of transaction, the importance of cash is going down. Now I come to your point. If the trend accelerates and we don't have shops, magazines accepting cash anymore, like it's almost the case in Sweden and Norway, then you have your described um, applications, PayPal, and you listed them all. Where are they from? Where are they from? They're exclusively all from outside the euro area. So, and there's a rising political um, worry that the payments are completely in the hands of non-euro area private companies. That is a risk that might be overestimated, exaggerated, but as an option, as an insurance, it would be good that you have a sovereign money provided by the European Central Bank, uh, ideally also with a bigger role of private firms supervised by a European, uh, European governance framework. If you want to do something against PayPal, that's not helpful because PayPal would simply use your CBDC as another payments object. So the one wonderful thing with PayPal, I'm not paid by PayPal, but the wonderful thing with PayPal is that it is completely interoperable. It has an unlimited interoperability. Yeah? So it can just puts puts its payment system on everything. And so if you if you have the digital euro, PayPal would just use digital euro accounts as an, another account, like a bank account. So and, and if you really want to do something against these global international payments providers, then it's not the right thing to have some kind of payments objects, digital euros. Then you really have to have to develop a full, fully blown alternative to payment systems like PayPal or, or like DM. And then it has to be then it has to be global. Then it has to be uh, can, you have to, can must use all kinds of currencies. And if you say the international use is not a priority of the digital euro, how can you succeed? If, I, if I'm in the United States, if I'm traveling outside the euro area and I cannot use my digital euro for payments, what, it's, it's, what, 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 why should I use this, this kind of, of, of payment? Uh, and, and people buying things on the internet from outside the euro area, and you have, you have a digital euro which can only be used within the euro area. I think that's absolutely not attractive. And will not succeed. That's my my main point. So but I you mean, can you can you can have an exchange rate in between. I mean, these are these are we, you're you're talking about as if we had already some technical uh, design in place. No, 
But if, if you have a digital euro in place, um, if you are in the US and then you pay, there would be an exchange rate mechanism in between. How that is then done and settled, that's a completely different question. The idea of what I was describing now is that you would not necessarily pay with euro then in the US, but um, the idea is not to, to have not the possibility to, to pay outside. But how this is then done, no one thinks of a euroization of the whole world. Nowadays, you can pay with your, with your cards outside the euro area, and then you have some exchange rate mechanism and a settlement in your own currency. Yeah. But the, the real question is, do you want a euro, digital euro payment system, which competes with global, other global payment systems, or do you want a euro payments object that can be used if you pay with your credit card, if you pay with PayPal? Uh, so that's that's the main, that's the fundamental question. I think it's not so clear for the ECB where they want to go. So I think, let me jump in here. I think this also goes back a bit to, to what Miguel has said. And I think that this, this discussion here shows that it's far from clear for what exactly we need a, a digital euro. And um, that's, as I understand it, also the approach of the ECB that said, uh, let's not start building a euro or agree on blockchain and then, and then to talk about what we needed for later but the, the approach was let's talk about potential use cases and as we see it's still it's still far from clear what a use case um, might be miguel has mentioned um, uh, one one reason why we might want to introduce a, a cbdc i would like to bring up another reason which is um, um very often hotly debated and it was also um, as i have understood the the answer that has come most uh, on the consult during the consultation period the ecb has started and this was the use case uh, anonymity because today we do not have a digital means of payment that um, allows anonymity. And in particular, since we talk of digital cash, when we talk about the digital euro, something like anonymity um, would be an, an important uh, use case. And I will actually start with uh, Julian here and maybe first uh, ask Julian and then, uh, then Jürgen, uh, would DM allow something like anonymity? So to what extent would it be possible to make anonymous payments uh, with, with DM? That's a great question. Uh, thank you, Alex. And if I, I were to come to Dr. Schaff today or, or, or uh, Dr. Bofinger, even uh, uh, Mr. Miguel Fernandez when he was in his role as governor, and I came to you with a proposition of uh, cash that was anonymous, fairly opaque, uh, that could be a carrier of the, the COVID um, uh, strand, would you accept it today? And, and maybe the, the, the answer is no, you wouldn't accept it today. So uh, anonymity, the way we're building the system for, for this initial phase, of course, as you know, is with regulated virtual asset service providers. And in that, uh, there is a KYC process that, that, that uh, is being put in place. Therefore, you know, the, the individuals that will operate initially um, on, on the system will be known individuals, uh, very similar to when you wire money right now through uh, traditional analog rails, you need to provide uh, basic forms of, of uh, identification. The real friction I think that we're seeing in the world today is uh, more around the need for digital uh, identities. Um, uh, that uh, will bring some comfort level, I think, to some of the regulators and authority bodies that think that anonymous payments are uh, completely used for nefarious acts. Um, I'm not the believer that uh, one uh, aspect is a trade-off of the other aspects. I think you can still have a strong compliance system with basic types of uh, information, therefore not truly be uh, completely anonymous like cash is today. But again, I believe it should be a consumer optionality. I believe the consumer should choose whether or not they want to um, uh, pay uh, their, their, uh, their friends in cash or, or they want to pay their friends with a DM coin or they want to pay their friends with uh, one of the traditional uh, payment systems. It should really be a consumer option. And moving forward, it'll be interesting to see what users demand from uh, payment system operators as far as uh, providing their digital identities and some of their uh, personal personal and identifiable information. Yeah, may, I, may I add something on this question? Because sometimes I think that uh, that should be relatively easy, that is to maintain the system we have today. Today, what is the system we have? We have cash that is anonymous, and we have the digital that is provided by the bank that is not anonymous. Uh, the banks knows all the data and the authorities have access to those data for purpose of fiscal administration, laundering and so on. Well, 
It could be the same. We are going to maintain cash, as Jürgen has said. No problem. We are going to have, if you want. And the, the, the service providers that are not going to be only the banks will be submitted to the same rule that, like now, that they are have, they is not anonymous. Because why we should design as anonymous the digital money if now it's not uh, uh, anonymous? And we, it's important to maintain what the, the good things that we have now in our system. It's very good to maintain without any special change and thinking and that the, the, the money has to have remuneration and these things like that. Money do not have remuneration. The cash will, will, will not have. And you maintain. And, and central banks are independent and you maintain that. Only change the problems of safety, monetary policy, and lack of competition. You should change that, but not the rest. I mean, why, why we are going to have a digital anonymous if we don't have now? Yeah, so thanks, thanks a lot, Miguel, for bringing in this, this point. So last question before we go into the Q&A, and, and maybe uh, Jürgen Schaff, you can, you can keep it short if it's possible. How does the ECB um, think about anonymity or privacy, given that it was uh, so important to the, in, in the answers um, on your consultancy? Like now? Um, Indeed, it's, 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 it has been the most important issue in the consultation with the general public, but also with the uh, uh, with banks, um, industry association and the like. And we will take this very seriously. As I said, we are, we are, it's far too early to judge where we end, but um, privacy will be of utmost importance. It's actually also possible. I mean, I'm very sympathetic for what the governor has just said. But uh, it's, it's also possible to uh, program digital monies to a varying degree of, um, of privacy. We, we, we tested that together in a project with the Bank of Japan, I think two years ago. So technologically, it's, it's not so difficult. That's then more a political or a conceptual decision. But for us, it's clear. Um, on the one hand, there has to be some obeyance to the AML rules, of which we are not in charge. But then again, uh, privacy is valued very, very high. Some intermediate solutions like that the banks or those in between have to do the checks, or limits, uh, the usage and the like you could think of, but that's at this stage only speculation. But from our perspective, it's definitely a promise that we take it very serious to deliver on privacy. Okay, thank you. So um, time is flying. We have eight minutes left and I would hand over to Lena again for one or two uh, questions from the, from the viewers. Okay, so we have received quite a few questions um, and several are targeting the topic of helicopter money. Um, so I would like to ask you, Mr. Bofinger, um, what do you think about that? Do you think CBDC, especially in the Eurozone, could be, um, could be a way to provide helicopter money or would you say that should not be an option? Um, a bit of background, one of our viewers said that um, in China with the digital yuan, they're already testing um, to provide helicopter money uh, to the public using their CBDC. Well, I think the idea of helicopter money is to uh, stimulate consumption. But for this, you don't need CBDC. You can just send uh, consumption vouchers to the population. And that's, I think, much easier. And, and it has been practiced, I think, in Japan, also in the United States. So there's no reason uh, to establish the whole uh, CBDC infrastructure that everybody needs an account with the central bank. And that's something that the ECB obviously also does not want. So if 80 million people opening an account with the Bundesbank and then you use it for just for, for helicopter money, just send them checks by the government and that's much easier. Okay, thank you. Then we have another question um, regarding uh, whether a CBDC could decrease activities of the gray economy or financing uh, criminal activities. I would first like to ask Julian on this. Um, has DM any plans on how to um, maybe uh, observe criminal activities and make sure that DM is not used in order to um, make criminal transactions? Certainly, Lena, and I think blockchain is, is really the superpower here. Um, we, we are building a strong compliance into the framework. Um, Again, with regulated virtual asset service providers that will follow the, their local jurisdictions, in addition 
um, we, we've built uh, and are uh, uh, building a financial intelligence function unit that is housed within uh, the association itself to take a look at these things. And one of the beauty of, of blockchain technology, you can have uh, uh, nodes that uh, view the blockchain. Uh, therefore, um, you could foresee a world where um, being at open source, we are not the only ones that are looking at what is happening on the blockchain and therefore we can really get uh, intercontinental type of collaboration and vision on these transactions that are occurring. Therefore, when you think of uh, cash in, in, in the current system going from a hand to hand, uh, there's absolutely uh, no way of, of, of anybody knowing that particular transaction took, took place between these two individuals. Whereas on the blockchain, um, you, you, you will have a trace, uh, whether it's through the regulated um, uh, wallet providers or whether it's through the DM blockchain, there will be a trace of a particular transaction. Therefore, I feel like it is a, a, a much more transparent uh, than in the traditional sense of uh, uh, using cash for transactions uh, for uh, nefarious acts. Okay, thank you. I would like to pass on that question to you, Mr. Schaaf. How is um, the ECB implementing mechanisms in order to prevent uh, criminal activities? Um, we are not the police. We are not the uh, prosecutor or anything. So um, the, the, the feature of cash is anonymity. Uh, that's, that's what we know, that's a tradition. No one actually knows if this feature of cash was a design or if this was an accident, it's just the way it is. Now, privacy is slightly different um, and we take that very seriously, but not in order to make it easy or keep it easy for criminals to do their business. Uh, we should not be naive. Prosecution is with the prosecutor and the police, that's not our task. And um, they will always find ways um, to do their illicit activities, uh, what we are trying to do is to improve the means um, of how people pay also in the future, that they have access to sovereign money. Um, we are not trying to chase criminals. Um, we are also definitely not trying to promote criminal activity. So this is not the scope of our endeavor right now. But I would say I'm pretty sure that people who are active in the informal economy, they will prefer cash, even if you have the nicest uh, uh, CBDC. So if, you've, if it's not recorded, it's always better than to have it in some kind of digital uh, account. And so I think there is no way that the CBDC uh, could, could be used for, for criminal activities or would be used for criminal activities in, in, in this way, substituting cash. Okay, thank you. So we're running out of time, actually. I would like to address uh, one last question. It will be a short question. I would also like to ask you for a brief answer. So um, Alex currently lives in Switzerland, and we all know living expenses are pretty high over there. So he might be struggling to get by sometimes. And in five years, I might have a fancy job, and I could use some of my money to support him financially. Um, so how would I send my euros from Frankfurt, where I currently live, to Switzerland so that Alex could withdraw Swiss francs. Um, Mr. Ardenius, I would like to ask you first, imagine you had a crystal ball that could take you into the future five years. Um, how do you think would I make that transfer? Would I send a digital euro via a cross-border and a cross-currency payment? Or maybe would I use DM or transfer-wise, which we already have today? Or maybe I would even just use a regular transfer. I think, you, I think you will do like uh, we do now, sending something more complicated, that is a photograph and a video. You take your smartphone and you send. It's just 80 euros is two digits. And a video is something uh, terrible <laughs> to send. Then I think uh, you will use the, the smartphone and no problem. <laughs> OK, thank you. Mr. Bofinger, what do you think? Just use PayPal. <laughs> of course, I have to say one thing, they are quite expensive for this, uh, if, you, if you pay in different currencies, but that's why we need competition. Yeah? I think that's, that's a, so PayPal does everything, but, but if you make international transfers, they're quite expensive, and that's why we need more competition in, in this field. And so maybe DM uh, would help to get the to transfer costs lower. 
Julian, would I be able to use DM in five years? I absolutely hope so, but I think it's really generational, Lena, and I'm glad that both Miguel and Peter used technology as the first answer instead of, uh, you know, uh, the mechanics behind it. I truly believe that uh, blockchain and all of the complexities that we currently have in that technology will fade in the background and that it'll be as easy to send uh, uh, as a text message to send that money through, but if you still want to Uh, stuff an envelope with with some euros, send it to Alex. Alex opens it, goes to an exchange and gets his Swiss francs. Uh, knowing Alex, I, I think he'll probably be more of the uh, technology guru and using uh, um, his smartphone, uh, hopefully via DM, uh, a small plug for DM. But Lena, I, I really believe in five years, you'll have more competition, more options to be able to make that payment to whatever your comfort level is. Okay, thank you. Mr. Schaaf, will I be able to use the digital euro in five years to send money to Switzerland? Well, um, I guess and I hope you will have the choice between different means of transferring the money with the involvement of some sound sovereign money. So sovereign money in the sense of central bank money involved um, and some uh, smooth applications um, with nice features, it should be fast, it should be secure, it should be easy to do, and you should have to cho the, the choice how to do it. Okay, thank you, that sounds good. So I guess we're closing the panel at this point. Thank you very much for, for your time and for your answers and the vibrant discussion. Yes, so thank you also a lot from my side. I think it was a great discussion. We had diverse opinions and we actually had a discussion. This is not always the case when you when you listen to panel discussions nowadays. So I hope also, uh, thank you, of, of course, also to our uh, viewers. I hope this was also interesting um, for you. And then again, um, Miguel Ordonez, Jürgen Schaaf, Julian Le Gog and Peter Bofinger, thanks a lot for coming and, and for taking part in this panel. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Great discussion.